Today, let's talk about the Roman Senate, how it operated and some of its rules and procedures. It's easy when talking about the Roman Senate to think about modern legislatures, but a lot of things make the two dissimilar. For starters, membership in the Senate was for life, and yet members were enrolled at the beginning of their political careers. Entry into the Senate was not an end goal, but rather a first step. This fact meant that there was a huge age range in the Senate at any one time, from young men in their early 30s to old men in their last senile years. Speaking of senile old men, the word senile takes its root from the Latin word senex, meaning old. The word senator comes from the same root word. The senators, or old men of Rome, were popularly imagined to be old men of experience who would submit their seasoned advice to the younger men who were serving in elected office for that year. In practice, the older men were actually the ones writing the nation's laws. While the Senate may have been powerful, individual senators were not. Individuals who successfully gained lifetime membership in the Senate did not automatically gain very much power or influence. The Senate maintained a strictly hierarchical power structure, which curbed the ability of untested men to exert political influence. The serving consuls had the opportunity to speak first, followed by the ex-consuls, starting by those who served last year, then two years ago, then three, and so on. Next came the praetors, followed by the ex-praetors in a similar descending order based on year served, and so on. As you can see, serious discussion could easily be monopolized by the ex-praetors and the ex-consuls. There just weren't enough hours in the day to hear from everybody. The Romans understood this all too well and had a slang term for senators who could never get a chance to speak. They called them pedarii, meaning walkers. Voting in the Senate wasn't done with raised hands or with yeas or nays like we do today. It was done by standing up and walking over to the person whose position you were supporting when the final vote was called. This was the only means of influence that the pedarii had. We have a similar term today for these kinds of people, which is backbenchers. Interestingly, the Romans could have easily used the exact same term. Roman senators also sat in order of precedence, with their most important senators sitting up front as shown here. The pedarii always sat in back. Plus, unlike our backbenchers, Roman senators literally sat on benches. But they went with the word pedarii instead. Whatever. The Romans had a name for the highest ranking senator. They called him the Princeps Senatus. This literally just means that he was the first senator since he was the first listed on the official senate rolls. He was always the ex-consul with the most personal authority or influence amongst his peers, and was usually a very old man. But he wasn't just the first man listed on the senate rolls. For long periods of Roman history, the Princeps Senatus had special privileges, such as the right to convene and dismiss the Senate, the right to propose legislation, and the right to rule on points of order, such as who would speak first when two senators of equal rank wanted the floor. This was an extremely powerful and prestigious position. Also, being the Princeps Senatus ranked a man higher than all other ex-consuls. This may have been his most important power because it meant that if he wanted, he always had the opportunity to comment on legislation first. Sometimes, if a well-respected Princeps Senatus spoke passionately and eloquently, he could turn an entire chamber for or against a motion before a debate had even begun. Let's quickly run through this whole process from beginning to end. To begin the process of passing a bill, the Senate had to be called to meet. Only specific people could do this. Consuls, Praetors, Tribunes of the Plebs, and the Princeps Senatus. Nobody else. Let's say that a consul called on the Senate to meet. At the meeting, he would read his proposal in front of the Senate, make a few introductory remarks in its favor, and then debate would commence. Speaking order, as always, began with the Princeps Senatus. Debate would progress, with the Princeps Senatus acting as referee as needed. After the consul overseeing the meeting decided that the debate was over, he would call a vote and take an official count. In this case, the proposal passes. Next, the consul would move on to the popular assembly. A scheduled vote would take place a minimum of three market days later to give people time to think about the proposal. The same consul would preside over this assembly just like he did with the Senate. As before, he would read the proposal and then give some introductory remarks. Now, he was allowed to invite people of his choosing up to make speeches in support of his proposal. At the consul's discretion, a vote would be called. In this case, the proposal passes. 
At this point, the proposal officially has the force of law, and it is now up to the consuls and the praetors to make sure it goes into effect. As with the selection of a king during the days of the monarchy, the People's Assembly did not have the power to debate a bill, but only to vote yes or no. The person convening the public assembly wielded immense power, since unlike debate in the Senate, he got to decide who spoke and what they spoke about. The fact that the public was presented with just one side of the debate may explain why public assemblies more or less functioned as rubber stamps. There is also some evidence that suggests that votes to approve Senate proposals were actually very weakly attended, and that proponents of the bill could easily stuff the crowd full of supporters and allies. That's how the Senate functioned on a day-to-day -day basis. Next week we'll take a brief detour from Senate procedure and talk about a fascinating Roman public holiday. Thanks for watching.